welcome. I would uh, first like to give a big uh, and warm welcome to all of you at our uh, 15th virtual environmental ergonomics uh, session and give you best regards from uh, snowy and wintry Ljubljana in Slovenia. My name is Tadej de Belec and I'm um, privileged to be co-organizing uh, these webinars together with Stephen Chung from Brock University in Canada and Chris Tyler from uh, University of Roehampton uh, in the UK. Given the time of the day, I guess I can say uh, good morning to all of our um, European and African colleagues. Good afternoon or good evening to friends from Asia and uh, Australia. And I guess our colleagues from North and South America are sleeping tightly and they'll have to watch the, the webinar, uh, the recordings of the webinar. Uh, so as you know, the uh, topic of today's webinar is uh, uh, hypoxic training with particular reference to team sports applications. But before we kick off the session, I would just like to share a few general information uh, with you regarding the, the series. In particular, as I've mentioned before, we already hosted 14 uh, uh, virtual environmental ergonomics sessions with 32 excellent speakers on variety of topics on, on environmental and exercise or sports ergonomics. And uh, should you want to uh, revisit any of those sessions, you can always do so because all of the sessions are posted on our um, webpage, which is icee2021.com. And under the tab past talks, you will able to access all of the sessions recorded as well as the student handouts that can be used by, by lecturers or instructors during their courses in uh, environmental uh, ergonomics. I would also like to remind you that after this session, we have obviously subsequent sessions planned and in particular, the Christmas edition of the virtual environmental ergonomics will feature, uh, will, uh, feature uh, the talks by Julia Tayas and Brigitte Ganse from UK and Germany about the physiological challenges of uh, space flight and associated um, countermeasures. And then we'll kick off the 2021 um, season with a thermoregulatory session featuring Nicole Garrett and Nate Morris, and then hydration with Gabriela Girsch and Tori Stone. And uh, the first of the February session will be on managing travel or jet regulated issues in both occupational and sports settings with our second returning speaker, Sean, Dr. Shonda Morrison, and uh, Professor Krista Jensen van Rensburg from um, South Africa. Uh, I would also like to remind you that during the session, you will be able to interact with the, with the speakers and the panelists and other participants via the Q&A feature. Uh, at the bottom of your screen, you can post your questions, comments there, and we'll try to convey them to the speakers and discuss discuss these questions during the, the session. What we'll probably do is we'll probably uh, we'll have two, two, um, two talks and a bit of an applied uh, angle at the, at the end and then we'll keep the majority of the questions for after, after both, uh, both talks. Uh, so uh, uh, to start off, it's really a pleasure to, to today to host um, this session, which features two excellent speakers, in particular, Professor Olivier Girard and uh, Professor Brandon Scott. Uh, Olivier is, although he's French, he has, so to speak, traveled the world and is currently working uh, as a professor at the School of Human uh, Sciences at the University of Western Australia. Uh, with, uh, and our second speaker, uh, Brandon Scott, uh, he also uh, is from Australia and is affiliated with the College of Science, Health and Engineering and Education at Murdoch uh, University in Australia. Uh, the topic of today's talk, in particular hypoxic training, is also very uh, dear to me as I did most of my PhD work on the topic. But um, uh, when I started that long time ago in 2006, the vast majority of studies or focus of this work 
was mostly related to endurance athletes or to improving the endurance performance. And that's why it's really good to see that during this last 15 years or so, uh, many novel hypoxic training uh, modalities have been developed with, from div with excellent work from different labs around the world which might not only be beneficial for endurance athletes, but also for team athletes, or might even have some uh, clinical applications. And uh, not to take too much wind from the, the uh, talks, I will, uh, without further ado, I will uh, pass the mic to, uh, to Olivier and ask him to share his screen and um, start his talk. Olivier, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Tadesh. Uh, everybody can see me and hear me correctly. Yeah, that's all good then. Good. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. And again, thank you from uh, you, Stephen and uh, Chris for organizing this series. So today with my colleague Brandon, we are uh, talking from beautiful Perth, Western Australia, where this picture is taken from. Uh, but as you highlighted, I'm, I'm French and you know, I have to confess, like, as much as I love Perth, you know, I'm missing two things in Perth. One is obvious, is the cheese. And the second one is the mountain, as you can see in the, in the backdrop. But luckily, uh, even if you live close to sea level, you can still simulate hypoxia with advance in technology. And uh, using these methods, we can now, like, fit the needs of many uh, um, sports, not only endurance athletes, but also the team sports so that we can provide them with a physical advantage to improve the performance. All right, jumping back in time. Um, so 1968, I'm sure everybody is familiar with the Bob Beeman world record that was really uh, remarkable a uh, new uh, mark close to nine meter which was more than half a meter improvement from the previous mark and so that's the starting point of our symposium today really the 1968 olympics in mexico it was quite clear that all the sprinters throwers jumper they benefited from altitude they all improved their uh, performance on the other side there was no world record in the middle and long distance heavens and also something that was quite remarkable was that all the gold medalists, they came from middle uh, Africa, uh, where there are some, some mountain, obviously. And so I believe this is about this time that the concept of altitude training was born with the primary objective of uh, improving acclimatization when you have to compete at altitude. But that's not the topic of today. Today, we're going to try to understand how we can take advantage of these methods to further improve performance when you're back at sea level. So long story short, uh, we basically have three main methods of altitude training. The main one being the classical one is the leave high, train high, where you're gonna spend a few weeks in the mountains by exposed continuously, where you also train in the mountain. And this way, what you're after is to improve the blood carrying capacity. But because the training intensity cannot be maintained similar to sea level, Ben Levin uh, in the 90s came up with the concept of the live high, train low, where uh, you live in the mountains, but you will go down in the plane for a few sessions during the week in, in order to maintain the oxygen flux. And today we are more interested in the live low, train high methods. These methods, let me this clear, are not new. I've been developed uh, around the Second World War for acclimatization of the pilot. But yeah, you're right. In the last 10 to 15 years, there are recent in innovation in this, uh, in this field with the belief is that it's going to improve the non emergical factors. And so you can tolerate fatigue during high intensity efforts. So earlier today, uh, together with some colleagues, I put together this updated panorama of the leave low train high methods where we can use some passive methods such as ischemic preconditioning or hypoxic exposure at rest but also combined with exercise. So basically you can induce hypoxia either locally or systematic uh, use of hypoxia through a breathing through the, through the mass, for example. And today, Brendan's task will be to give you an update about the latest advancement in the uh, exercise with blood flow restriction, but also performing resistance exercise with hypoxia. My task will be to talk about uh, repeated sprint training method. That is one of the new method that was uh, developed in, in this field. 
I like to put a bit of context and then understand from where we are coming from. And I think this study was really important in the history of altitude training. It was published by a group of researchers in, in Bern in Switzerland. And what they did, they trained for six weeks, participants five times a week, and they divided in four groups. Group uh, training in hypoxia, normoxia, with low or high intensity. What you have displayed on this slide is the result of the um, molecular analysis through muscle biopsy. And when you see blue, it means that the pathway in question are upregulated. So what becomes obvious from this slide is that when you combine hypoxic training and high intensity, you're going to get upregulation of many of the regulatory pathway, which you might not get or to, you might get to a lower extent if you train near sea level or at low intensity. However, there is no corresponding uh, increase in the performance, right? Even so you improve like the neurological factors in the muscle. It's not always that you get better outcome in terms of, of performance. But in general, we associate training in hypoxia at high intensity has more chance to improve the performance compared to when you do so in normoxia or at lower intensity. But something that we need to consider is that when you're exposed to hypoxia, maximal oxygen uptake is gonna be reduced is going to be reduced by about 1% for every 100 meters above 1500 meters. So in the study in question here, we are talking about a decrease by about 25% in the VO2 max. And this has implication for training. So it means that there will be a lower absolute exercise intensity due to hypoxic exposure once the intensity is relatively matched. And it means that normoxia with high intensity or hypoxia but lower intensity actually it's a similar stimulus for the body. And if it's a similar stimulus, there is no surprise. It means that the performance improvement will roughly be similar. And this is something that we highlighted is that, yes, uh, heat, even so you create some adaptation at the muscle level, not always you have better adaptation in terms of, of performance. And this is the starting point of our reflection with Professor Mie and Rafael Fais for his PhD, is that we wanted to propose a new method where uh, we have more chance to translate the improvement at the muscle level in terms of physiology into the performance outcome. So now we're talking about repeated sprint training in hypoxia. So that's a relatively new method. When I say new, uh, first published evidence was only in 2013, based on repetition of all out sprinting with incomplete recovery. The way it works, and this is why I miss France, somehow you can understand now on this beautiful video from the French Alp, where the rugby too long club was coming in 2015 to train at 3000 meters on top of the glacier by doing all out effort repeatedly. So the why I like environmental physiology is that as a sports scientist, I feel that we can make a contribution to the performance of the team by proposing new method that will give athletes a competitive edge. And as I say, like the first evidence 2013, but only two years after you can see that those methods were already employed into practice, which is quite remarkable. Usually like the time lag is, is much longer, right? So I saw that first I need to explain what is repeated sprint ability. So that's the ability to produce the best average uh, sprint performance of a series of sprint. Repeated sprint ability depends obviously on the sprint performance during the actual sprint, but also the recovery in between the maximal effort. So the ability to generate a uh, high burst of power through delivering like uh, uh, the, the energy supply during the sprint, but also uh, the removal of the metabolic waste or the energy supply during the recovery will determine the repeated sprint ability. And so neuromuscular and metabolic aspect are very important to try to improve this fitness component. So on this graph, you have five sprint for three different athletes. One is the sprinter, a team sport athlete in blue, and a marathon runner. So who's having the best repeated sprint ability? Well, I think I gave you the answer in the previous slide. Uh, obviously, when you look at the first sprint, the sprinter will go faster, right? Like compared to the marathon, and then the team sport would be in between. But something to consider is that when you repeat efforts, the sprinter will decrease more the sprint performance across the repetition of effort and the marathon runner will have a smaller decrease. But it doesn't mean that the marathon runner has a good repeated sprint ability because the best sprint ability is uh, the average of the power output across the all sprint effort, right? So in this example, that will be the team sport athletes. Right, 
If I ask you uh, who's going to benefit from altitude training, I'm pretty sure that you will imagine that those sports on the right hand side of the slide will be the one target. But today I'd like to change and challenge this by saying that maybe the team sport athletes, they can also benefit right from altitude training. But maybe if they benefit, that's going to be through different methods compared to what has been proposed so far. And I like to think that repeat sprint training in hypoxia is one of these methods. So let's uh, take a step back again in history. And soon after the Mexico Olympics, this consensus statement was produced. And if you read what's there on this slide, it's quite interesting, right? Altitude training at this time was considered to be offered only to Olympic competitors in continuous endurance event. Things have changed remarkably, right? And in 2013, you know, I got this hopefully genius idea, I hope to think that uh, well, of course, I, I got married, so that's why this year was very particular to me. But let's be more serious. In 2013, I organized this altitude training and team sport uh, symposium in, in Qatar, where I invited uh, many leaders in the field, and we produced this content statement and this whole issue about maybe the usefulness of this approach. So the first ever published study on repeated sprint training in hypoxia was coming from uh, Grégoire Smi Lab in, in Lausanne from Raphael Face. So what they did, they recruited 50 cyclists, they divided them in normoxid and hypoxic group. And what they did, they trained them twice a week for four weeks. So eight training session, according to this model of set of sprint or cluster approach, if you like, in order to prevent uh, the pacing to happen. They measure a bunch of things, uh, but today I'm going to talk about the repeated sprintability test only that was performed up to exhaustion before and after the four weeks of training. On top of the slide, you have the repeated sprint training in normoxia, and at the bottom, the group that trained in hypoxia. That's the data before the training intervention. And the way it worked is that the test was top 10 seconds on, 20 seconds off, when the performance was decreased by 30%, right? That was the task failure. As you can see, the group, they were matched before the intervention. And what happened after the training? Well, in the group that trained in Omoxia, the training was obviously efficient because on average, the power output was increased by 7%, but they were not able to perform more sprint. If you look at the bottom, this is where it's quite striking, right? The power output was also on average increased, but they were able to postpone the fatigue because now after eight sessions, they're able to perform about 40% more sprint on average. This study was performed in Qatar, and actually, to my knowledge, that the first study that's been conducted in this area with data collected in 2008 by Professor Mie again. So what we did in this study is that we trained Aspire kids for five weeks, two sessions a week in hypoxia and normoxia. And similarly, we saw that the group that trained in hypoxia in blue had twice larger improvement in the repeated sprint agility test compared to the group that trained in normoxia. Similar training, the only difference was that one group was training 3,000 meters simulated altitude and the other group uh, with the mission off. So here's the map of the world with the different um, places or labs where repeated sprint training was uh, assessed early days. Obviously, the first one being in Lausanne, in Qatar, in the UK, and ways in Western Australia, and also Rafael Face was going uh, also in uh, Sweden and also in Japan. As you can see, it's a different mix of athletes, uh, sports, and uh, Frank Brochery who did this PhD on that topic as well, put together this meta-analysis in 2017, uh, including 12 studies from six research groups. And it was quite clear that overall, there is an advantage of performing repeated sprinting by being exposed to hypoxia compared to the same training without hypoxic exposure. Since 2017 and up to 2019, like you can see that the number of studies that have been published like increased tremendously. And today we have about 25 studies on that topic. And what is tr striking is that almost 90% uh, of the study will find an additional advantage of performing these methods in hypoxia compared to, to normoxia. And things continue to evolve. Today, you can see that you can also perform repeated sprinting in ecological situation. This is in Paris at Roland Garros and the French Tennis Federation has this beautiful facility where you can play tennis in hypoxic condition in the middle of Paris. So 
On this slide, I put all the studies in the MIES analysis from 2019, and I've plotted at the bottom the number of training weeks and on the uh, y-axis, the number of sessions. And you can see three clusters. The, track, the classic approach where you train twice a week for four or five weeks, um, an approach where you're gonna train every day for one week, and one approach that is the one that I like to present now, that is the training camp approach where, you know, training camp will be most of the time in team sport two weeks. So in two weeks, we are talking about adding four to six training session, right? During the course of the training intervention. So now I'm gonna talk about study by Frank Borchery in 20, 2015. So as I say, team sport, you need to be quick, but you also need to be able to repeat the maximal effort, right? So you need to develop aerobic and anaerobic uh, aspect of performance. So in this study, we wanted to provide a new training models in order to show the usefulness of the leave high, train low and high. So what we did is that we recruited 30 team sport athletes, field hockey. We invited them to Qatar where they spent two weeks and we tested them the week after and then again, three weeks after the camp. So we have a control group, the leave low, train low and then two experimental group. The two experimental group, they were sleeping in Qatar in the dorms and uh, they accumulated about 200 hours over the course of the two weeks. The three training groups did the field hockey practice in, in Normoxia and the two experimental group, they also supplemented the training with repeated sprint training session. The leave high train low group did the training the sprinting, if you like, in normoxia, but the leave high, train low, and high did the sprinting in, in hypoxia. And that was done in this tent. Uh, that's quite a unique piece of equipment. It's a 45 meter long tent uh, where in the middle of desert in Qatar, you're able to train in hypoxic condition. So you have here a picture of the 45 meter long and a picture from inside and even a video where we were able to train six athletes at the same time. The sprinting was for five seconds 25 seconds recovery. So in other words, every five seconds, one athlete will go. And then after they will start to go in the other direction. So this is how we implemented the repeated sprint training using ecological situation. How about the results? So on this slide, you have presented the hemoglobin mass using the CO rebreathing methods. In gray, we have the control group that was not exposed to hypoxia. And as expected, there was no change in the hemoglobin mass. The two experimental group, because they received the same dose of continuous exposure during the residence, about 200 hours, they are able to increase by three to four percent their hemoglobin mass and maintain those gain three weeks after the camp. But no difference between the two groups. The interesting part is here on performance, where you have the repeated sprintability test. Again, as expected, because the control group had no additional sprinting, there was no change in their repeated sprint performance. The way you should read that is that if the cumulated times decrease, that's an improvement in performance. So the two experimental groups improved the performance from before to immediately after the camp, but the improvement in performance for the group that had the training in hypoxia for the sprinting was twice larger. And secondly, was maintained three weeks after, whereas the group that trained in homoxia for the sprinting had twice smaller improvement in performance and this gain were lost after three weeks. So you might wonder, how should we explain that? And here we have some answer for you, hopefully. Uh, we're able to convince the athletes to take muscle uh, biopsy fr from them. And here you have presented the group that trained in normoxia uh, immediately after, and then three weeks after the camp for different regulatory pathway. And as you can see, repeated sprinting and combining with hypoxic exposure continuously is working, right? But if you look at what's happening for the group that train in hypoxia, you can see that all the oxygen sensing, carrying the mitochondrial metabolism and the, bio, the mitochondrial biogenesis markers, especially immediately after the training camp, were upregulated to a larger level compared to the, to the normoxic training group. So here are some answers why performance was largely improved in the hypoxic group. Right. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you can see more and more major reports and scientific publication about also the use of heat for uh, team sport athletes because many competitions obviously organized in hot environment 
and how we might combine heat and hypoxia. And this is something that the top team are doing. For example, in Japan, in preparation of the last World Cup, the Welsh rugby, what they did is that they were going to Turkey to be exposed to the heat for about two weeks. And they spent also time in, the, in fish in Switzerland to get the hematological adaptation. So um, that's the last study I'd like to present to you today. And I believe this is one of the largest, if not the largest study uh, involving team sport athletes where heat and hypoxia were uh, implemented during the training camp. I like to think that what we did was efficient because this team was world champion in 2018. So soon after they've been exposed to our condition, but yeah, it's hard to distinguish, right? Like there are so many other aspects in team sport that might explain performance. So more seriously, what, what we did is that they invited them in Qatar uh, for 10 days training camp where they practice rugby every day, but also every morning they had a training session. So session was on Monday, Wednesday, and so on, repeated sprint training. So five training sessions over the course of the training camp. And on Tuesday, Thursday, and so on, they had a continuous training. So the way it works is that there are like two hypoxic uh, condition, either normoxia or hypoxia for the repeated sprinting. And the continuous was to get heat acclimation. So it was either performed in temperate condition or hot condition. So what you can see here, the camp group is the group that had no exposure to environmental stress that was doing the repeated sprint in normoxia and the continuous in 20 degree. The altitude group was that group that did the repeated sprinting at 3000 meters, but was not exposed to heat stress. The heat group was this group that was doing the sprinting in normoxia, but were exposed to heat stress during the continuous 75 minute training session. And the lucky group is the altitude and heat group that was exposed uh, to 3000 meters during the sprinting and 35 degree during the continuous training. Pre and post tests, and this is what we observe. Uh, the camp group, the heat altitude, and the group that combined the two. Here you have presented the result for the maximal aerobic power, but the results were similar also for the yo-yo or for the repeated sprintability test. And the message here is that, well, we were a bit disappointed, right? We were expecting that maybe that group will get better adaptation. But what we saw is that first training is working and that's the good news, right? Like the performance was improved in the short term, only 10 days in really highly trained athletes by about 10% in the in-season period. But those improvements were similar in the four groups. Also something that you can see is that there is quite large interindividual variability, right? And then now we are trying to understand like what, why is that and how we can try to minimize that. But yeah, the conclusion from this large study is that addition of heat or hypoxia during this short-term intensified training camp has no additional benefit for performance. Having said that, what we observed that I like to think was quite interesting is that there was some partial heat acclimation during the five uh, session in 35 degree. And because we use a controlled heart rate approach during the endurance training session, what we observe is that the group that was exposed in the heat compared to the group that had no heat exposure, on average, a power output during the 75 minutes that was only three quarter of what it was in a temperate condition. And so it means that they are achieving the same benefits, but by doing less work, right? They are doing less work, less mechanical constraint, which like in the context of altitude training camp slash heat training camp, you know, when it's a lot of training happening at the same time, we are able to unload the lower limbs and maybe that's a good approach. And this is my last slide for, for today. Um, yes, today we have been talking about using heat or hypoxia actually <laughs> more than heat today to try to increase the training stimulus and hopefully get better adaptation. But what if the athletes get injured? As you can see, this gentleman, he has a cast here, so he cannot train at his full potential. So yeah, for him, maintaining the normal training, cardiometabolic stimulation will be a problem because that will cause mechanical constraint. So what if we use hypoxia, right? By using hypoxia, what we can do is uh, thanks to the stress of hypoxia and uh, the compensatory adjustment to maintain the cardiometabolic stimulation, but the mechanical constraint during the training as I just demonstrated during the heat exposure for these rugby players will be lowered. So that's potentially something interesting, right? For the return to play athletes or for some clinical population, if we're able to reduce the mechanical loading, that's gonna increase the take and the buy-in of, of the training. 
And this is some work that we are doing currently with some colleagues from, from Malaysia to try to understand how the internal and external load is gonna be changed. So I'd like to leave you today with some uh, take home message. The first one is, as you saw from the first slide, the panorama of the leave low train high methods is now much wider than it was just 10 years ago. Repeated sprint training in hypoxia, hopefully, uh, I convince you that it's a method that is emerging only seven years, but really popular more than today, I think 30 uh, published research, but even more importantly, it's used by many elite team sport athletes to try to create non hematurgical adaptation and increase performance for high intensity repeated efforts. And if you combine methods, uh, for example, the leave high trend low and high, by leaving high training low plus repeated sprint training, you can create additional benefits that you cannot have if you use either of these methods independently. So now the question is, well, okay, how do we optimize that? How we reduce the inter-individual response that you saw in the, in the rugby uh, players? So this is something uh, I like to discuss, but I'm gonna do that after Brendan's talk uh, when I'm gonna focus more on some practical implication. So with that, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. I'm looking forward to receive a question and hopefully be able to answer, answer them. Uh, I didn't put any thanks or acknowledgement here because I have more than 200 um, co-authors, so it will be too busy on that slide, but hopefully uh, they will be listed on my website. So if you like to go and, and check there. Like. So again, thank you and uh, looking forward to the practical application. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Olivier, for this extensive uh, and uh, intense presentation. I mean, uh, excellent work. Given that there are no uh, specific questions from the, the audience, I would suggest we go directly to Brendan and then we do the discussion after the, uh, the practical application at the end, if that's fine with you. So I would just invite Brendan to share his screen um, and um, present us with his talk. Hopefully that's all up there. You guys can see my slides. Excellent. Um, oh, one second. Sorry, that's that is the right talk. Um, okay, so thank you to everyone involved in in organising this. It, it's great um, in these times where we can't travel around the world to discuss our research with colleagues to have an opportunity to to talk about some new things that we're thinking about um, and hopefully receive some interesting questions as well. So. I'm going to focus my talk on some, again, novel approaches to using a hypoxic stimulus, but this time to improve muscular development and, and most of the time in response to resistance exercise. Well, I'll show some, some other information where we don't always have to use resistance exercise when we add a hypoxic stimulus to, to gain muscle size and potentially strength. But I'll begin this by discussing blood flow restriction and, and then move on to a more systemic approach to using hypoxia. Um, because blood flow restriction was really the, the first exploration into using a hypoxic stimulus in resistance exercise. And this was pioneered by Dr. Sato, who we can see on the slide there, boasting a pretty impressive set of arms for a guy in his 70s now, um, due to the, the katsu cuffs on his arms. Katsu uh, effectively translates to added pressure. Um, and that's what we're trying to do with blood flow restricted exercise. We're applying these thin what look like blood pressure cuffs to the top of the arms or top of the legs during exercise in an effort to alter the hemodynamics during training. And we can set the pressure of these cuffs um, almost at a Goldilocks level so that we can still allow arterial inflow into the limb. It's going to be somewhat diminished because of the pressure and therefore um, limiting oxygen uh, delivery to the limb. Um, but there's still some blood getting through it. We can occlude venous return at that same pressure because veins are, are easier to clamp down on. Now there's a multitude of studies now that have combined blood flow restriction with low load resistance exercise uh, and very consistently they demonstrate improvements in muscle size and strength and this uh, this meta-analysis published a couple of years ago does a, a really good job of showing that the magnitude of these adaptations uh, and so we can see that muscle size character so uh, as the, the measures of muscle hypertrophy down here tend to be pretty similar between a high load, more bodybuilding or strength training regime uh, when compared to when we implement low load exercise with blood flow restriction, which is really intriguing. We, we didn't used to think we could gain muscle size with loads of 20 to 40% of one rep max. These are warm up type of weights really. 
Um, but what's really interesting from particularly a team sport athlete perspective is that muscle strength doesn't seem to be, although it's increased with low, low blood flow restriction exercise, it's not optimized to the same level as when we lift heavy weights. Um, so hopefully that might become clear when I get through this slide, talking about some of the physiological responses that a couple of years ago we, we put together to try to explain why these responses might occur to a blood flow restriction stimulus. So of course we restrict blood flow to and, and from the muscles and we create a, a localized hypoxic environment. That's why this is included in this talk uh, in the, the exercising tissue. Now this combined with the fact that we're restricting or including venous return creates a, a pooling of metabolites within the limb itself or an increase in metabolic stress. We often refer to that as in the literature. Um, and when we combine this, this pooling of fluid within the, the cells and, and the, the limb itself, um, along with the fact that trapping metabolites within the cells could potentially draw fluid into the cell to equilibrate the, the osmotic gradient, um, one of the early mechanisms that was proposed by Jeremy Lenicky's group was that cell swelling could potentially increase the signaling processes downstream of, of this uh, stimulus because the cell perceives it as a threat to its integrity. So it initiates some processes to, to reinforce its structure. Now, early research noted substantial chronic responses. Growth hormone in one early study was increased 290 times from baseline levels following BFR exercise. But I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, the recent conflict in, in the literature around the anabolic effects of these uh, exercise-induced systemic increases in hormones. So maybe not the main driver, but worth noting nonetheless. Um, but when we combine that with the cell swelling uh, responses, there's a number of studies now that have demonstrated, particularly things like the mTOR pathway is upregulated with low, low blood flow restriction exercise, where it's not with the same exercise without the restriction in place. It's also some evidence of increased activity of satellite cells um, which has been put down to a hypoxic stimulus in the muscle and, and potentially some other reasons as well, which can enhance, uh, and particularly in the, the long-term training programs and muscle protein synthesis. Um, and another effect of the increased metabolic stress is potentially an enhancement in muscle fiber recruitment. So basically the fibers that you recruit in the early stages of exercise fatigue more rapidly. So you have to recruit more and more as the exercise goes on, meaning that a greater portion of the muscle is active during the exercise and therefore undergoes a stimulus for adaptation. So if we consider more of the, more of the muscle being stimulated to adapt in conjunction with a potentially increased uh, environment for muscle protein synthesis, we're going to see a, an increase in protein accretion, which results in a larger muscle and a stronger muscle by consequence. Uh, but this is where it gets to the, the, the point that I was discussing on the previous slide with not optimizing the strength qualities because we, we don't have at the moment any strong information around adaptations from a neural perspective to improve muscle strength development, which we know occur in response to high load training. So that's maybe where uh, I would definitely not recommend that healthy athletes always use blood flow restriction as their main modality of resistance exercise. I'm sure that no one really would, but um, we need to try to optimize neural mechanisms as well for those folks. Now, last year, uh, Stephen Patterson, a colleague of mine at St. Mary's University in the UK, put together a team of researchers around the world to basically come up with some guidelines for using blood flow restriction exercise in a range of different modalities. And many of you will be aware of the, the basic guidelines for resistance exercise. So the light loads that I've just talked about, 20 to 40% of one rep max. Moderate pressures, so sub-occlusive, 40 to 80% of the arterial occlusion pressure to get that Goldilocks pressure that I talked about before. Um, we need a, a pretty large volume of repetitions. So the standard repetition scheme has 75 reps in it. Um, because we're lifting light weight, we have to do more repetitions. Um, but what's perhaps even more interesting from a, a development of muscle mass perspective is that aerobic exercise with blood flow restriction can also provide a stimulus for muscle growth and strength improvements, particularly in deconditioned folks, um, along with improvements in cardiovascular fitness. Um, and this is walking with these cuffs on the legs or cycling at very slow speeds uh, with similar arterial occlusion pressure being applied for the blood flow restriction. And if we extend that even further, um, there's some evidence around using passive blood flow restriction. So in the absence of any muscular contractions to attenuate disuse atrophy. And so there seems to be something about this stimulus of changing hemodynamics, not even just in exercise, but in, in to, to a muscle uh, itself, 
that Im impacts on the uh, muscle protein synthesis and breakdown uh, within our muscles. And so if we think about this from a team sport athlete perspective, well, perhaps we can use this in the early stages of rehabilitation to enhance or e increase the, the rate at which injured athletes can return to play or return to training. So the first evidence around this passive blood flow restriction stimulus came 20 years ago now uh, out of Japan and they used uh, the ACL reconstruction patients, this passive restriction, uh, five sets of five minutes of occlusion with three minutes rest between morning and afternoon for the days three to 14 following ACL reconstructive surgery. And we can see here that the control group uh, who didn't have access to this blood flow restriction stimulus lost a substantial amount of muscle. This is cross-sectional area for the musculature of the thigh, like uh, the extensors and flexors. And although the experimental group also saw a decline in, in muscle size, well, it was less so than the control group. So maybe we can slow the rate at which we lose muscle in a period of disuse. And so a, a couple of years back, my, uh, my friend Jeremy Lenneke, who's done a very large amount of the research in this space, if you're ever reading blood flow restricted literature, you'll certainly come across his name. Uh, he proposed this series of progressions. If we think about a normal progression for an athlete uh, coming off a, a serious injury, there's going to be a period of bed rest where we're potentially going to see that disuse atrophy take hold when the athlete's then able to undertake some low levels of loading, there might be some walking, cycling, maybe some exercise in the pool. We probably won't see a big change in muscle mass and we'll see some small improvements when the individual can then overload the muscle with some light resistance exercise. But by adding blood flow restriction to the mix in, in all the different uh, phases, we can perhaps arrest some of the, the loss of muscle mass and speed up the rate at which we can accrue muscle uh, earlier in this rehabilitation process. But I think it's interesting to now take an alternative approach and look at some different modalities. So rather than just the low intensity, low load stimulus, uh, some researchers are starting to focus on using blood flow restriction in combination with higher intensity modalities of exercise. So some Iranian colleagues of mine uh, investigated using this for soccer players. We published this paper just that's impressive at the moment in the JSCR. Um, in youth semi-professional soccer players, they'll split into two groups, a BFR and a non-BFR. They did six weeks of, of training in the pre-season phase with a, this performance testing battery before and after the training intervention. And so all the training sessions looked like this with soccer drills, small sided games, plyometrics, normal type of soccer activities that you would expect. And the BFR group used the blood flow restriction stimulus throughout all of these drills. Every sport specific activity they undertook, they did it with a blood flow restriction stimulus in place. Now, something to note here, they didn't just apply the cuffs at the start of that session and take them off at the end. Um, they were only on in, in uh, for short, short durations during these drills. So for example, in a small sided game, the cuffs would be added, inflated for maybe a two minute period when the athlete was actually in the game, then they'd come out and rest, deflate the cuff. So they weren't on for an unsafe period of time. But when we looked at the, the adaptations following this exercise period, uh, change of direction ability um, with the Illinois agility test, uh, muscular endurance measured with knee, extens uh, knee extensions to fatigue and soccer specific endurance. So that was dribbling a soccer ball around a, a track. Um, they all improved substantially more in the blood flow restriction group compared to the control. And the other measures that we obtained, so strength and sprinting markers, they, they improved similarly between the groups. So blood flow restriction didn't hamper the adaptations here. Um, but I think that's important to not just take this and, and run with it and start implementing this in sport specific training, because what, what about the effect on skills? We know that blood flow restriction adds a pretty potent fatiguing response to particularly the periphery. And so it's likely that task execution could suffer. So there's small sided games or passing and, and shooting drills. Perhaps the athletes don't develop those, those capabilities as well as they would in an unrestricted circumstance. And because the blood flow restriction is such a demanding peripheral stimulus, particularly for very well-trained individuals, it, it's hard for them to uh, place enough stress on the cardiovascular system or more central responses to drive those adaptations forwards in things like VO2 max. There's some evidence of it, but it's probably going to be optimized by unrestricted higher intensity modes of exercise. So this is something we're looking to, to work on at, at Murdoch University at the moment. Hopefully um, in, in the next year or so, I'll have some results to be able to share with everyone on that. Another approach, perhaps going back to some of the injured athletes is 
um, blood flow restrictions beginning to be used for this uh, exercise induced hypoalgesia effect, decreased sensitivity to pain. Uh, this was nicely shown uh, with a study on participants who had anterior knee pain. They reported to a physiotherapy clinic and did these three exercise tasks, so a shallow and a deep single leg squat and a single leg step down. They rated their pain on a perceptual scale. Then they sat at the end of the physio bench and just did basic knee extensions with no additional resistance, rated their pain again during the task, undertook a treatment session and rated it a third time. And we can see that in all of these tasks, there was a decrease in pain sensitivity after the blood flow restriction that was maintained for the duration of the, the treatment session. And the, these guys extended their findings to compare a, a BFR group with a non-BFR group that did the knee extensions, uh, but without the blood flow restriction in place. And I think it's uh, really quite striking here that there's a, a very consistent response in the blood flow restriction group. We can see the, the individual spaghetti plots here. Whereas in the group that did the same knee extensions without BFR, the, the responses are all over the shop. So there seems to be something about the blood flow restriction that decreases the, the effects of pain in these individuals. Uh, and this is something that I know a lot of strength and conditioning coaches in Australia, at least, are starting to use for athletes who perhaps have very minor but niggly injuries that preclude them from doing highly demanding training sessions in certain times. So it's being used a little bit in practice, although there's no research on it just yet, um, pre-training to allow some folks to do high intensity training uh, following this as a part of a warm up. Um, and also if the athlete uses it during training, if they have serious orthopedic issues, well, you can get substantial improvements in muscular development without having to tolerate heavy loads. But of course, we know that the blood flow restriction stimulus is only applied to the muscles of the limbs, not the trunk and the hip, which are important uh, muscles for, for many athletes. It's difficult to implement in large groups. Um, and so we started to look into using a systemic hypoxic approach, which is what my PhD was actually focused on. Uh, as you can see in the, the little picture here, um, by having participants breathe a hypoxic air mixture, you can do multi-joint exercise with the same stimulus applied throughout the body. And particularly if you're in a, an environment where you have a, access to a, a chamber, um, you can have many athletes training at once altogether. And there's several studies that have reported benefits in muscular qualities following a hypoxic compared to a normoxic training intervention. So one of the, one of the good early studies that showed this um, probably the most promising results was by Nishimura and they demonstrated this is the cross-sectional area of the, the uh, elbow flexor muscles. A hypoxic exercise group outperformed in terms of muscle growth, uh, a normoxic exercise group and a hypoxic no exercise control group following six weeks of, of exercise. And when they examined strength responses, there was a, a faster increase and a larger increase after six weeks in a hypoxic compared to a normoxic group. So if we get thinking about what might be at play here and flip back to these uh, acute physiological responses, well, we know we, uh, we're getting at this hypoxic stimulus from a different perspective now by changing the concentration of air, the or oxygen in the air we breathe. We're taking away that hemodynamic shift though. And so this means that that accumulation of metabolites or metabolic stress, perhaps in conjunction with the satellite cell response now, really sits at the top of the tree for, for potential adaptations. So uh, a few years ago, we took this idea and ran with it. We first investigated high load exercise with long rest periods between sets, very few reps in a set because the weights are heavy, saw no benefits of the hypoxic stimulus because it's not a metabolically challenging exercise regime. And then we then moved on to this more bodybuilding type of regime. And we saw increases in blood lactate concentration measured. This is relative to baseline here in a high, pretty moderate level of hypoxia compared to a normoxic condition. Um, and when we looked at muscle activity in the muscles of the thigh and hip, um, we normalized our, uh, so this is the integrated EMG for groups of two repetitions in sets of 10, uh, normalized to repetitions in a warm up. And for several groups of these two repetitions, particularly in the quadricep muscles, we saw increases for the hypoxic compared to the normoxic group. Uh, now, my colleague Domingo Ramos Campo has taken this even a step further with a more potent metabolic challenge by using high load circuit training in hypoxia using a, a method like we can see on the slide here. Um, so this could potentially take even more advantage of the, the stimulus of hypoxia in conjunction uh, with the, the metabolic demands of the exercise. And they've measured improvements in or increases in metabolic stress in hypoxia compared to normoxia a decline in resistance exercise performance, a small but one worth noting, um, decrease in power and, and force. And just as an aside, 
Um, in some of the research we've done, we actually haven't seen this same response, but that's probably because we haven't used the same demanding circuit exercise. Uh, and some training adaptations that are important. So improvements in aerobic capacity, repeated sprint ability, but probably most notable for the, the theme of this talk, at least, is that there was no or trivial improvements in muscle size and strength. So maybe it's not so much about the metabolic stimulus. And I know that uh, Louise Del Dick actually presented a slide similar to this a, a couple of presentations ago in this series, uh, but her group started to look at the role that satellite cells might play in more detail. They noted that fractional synthetic rate, so protein synthesis was actually blunted uh, by a hypoxic stimulus in resistance exercise, but markers particularly of, pro of uh, satellite cell differentiation were exaggerated following a hypoxic training intervention. And so perhaps that's the, the role that hypoxia plays or an important role contributing to adaptations. It, the, this improved differentiation could enhance the potential for future growth across a long-term training intervention. Um, and I guess another final nail in the coffin for the, the, the thoughts that we used to have about this being all about metabolic stress is that there's a, a number of studies, or two studies now, that have uh, demonstrated high load training, which doesn't provide a potent metabolic demand, uh, can benefit from a hypoxic stimulus. We've previously looked at this in an acute sense and found no upregulation of some of the physiological measures that we obtained. Um, but there's two studies now that have used well-trained participants, which is important because they're the ones that typically will have access to these, uh, these type of training environments. Relatively brief uh, exposures to exercise and hypoxia, but larger improvements in muscle strength for hypoxic compared to normoxic uh, training interventions. And so maybe there actually is something to uh, a neural adaptation occurring in response to this brief exposure to hypoxia. I know there's some researchers examining uh, the effects of hypoxia on serotonin and, and that would of course if it can be enhanced that some of those neural mechanisms by serotonin release um, pr provide some uh, evidence of neural adaptation but we we obviously need much more information around that before we can uh, base conclusions upon that information so i guess um to sort of summarize what we know about these two different approaches to hypoxia in resistance exercise blood flow restriction that there's strong evidence for multiple modes of, of exercise and even uh, no exercise with blood flow restriction, just the, the passive approach, changing the balance to, between protein synthesis and breakdown. So that, that seems to be uh, a powerful approach. Um, with the resistance exercise and systemic hypoxia though, I, I think that there's, well, that there's basically as many studies that show a benefit as those that don't show a benefit. No study has shown a detrimental effect on developing these muscular qualities. But I really think we need to know more about the mechanisms um, and also about how to structure the exercise in a way that takes advantage of the hypoxic stimulus. Um, so just to finish off quickly, um, I'd like to thank my collaborators that, that have worked with me in this space uh, and also the research students who really do most of the grunt work while I sit in an office. Um, so hopefully we've got time for a couple of questions now perhaps, or um, we might go into the practical applications, Tadej. Yes, uh, thank you, Brandon, for this excellent talk. Maybe before we go to the practical, I would just um, um, give you one question from the from the audience, in particular from anonymous attendee, uh, and uh, he's asking about uh, uh, if there's a potential to use BFR for training uh, explosive power. You know, for uh, like jumping or you know um, mm. things like that. Yeah, that, that's, that's one I've actually talked to some strength and conditioning coaches about. Um, there's no research that supports that yet. The, the highest intensities of exercise that have been used as a couple of studies using just heavy strength training, and they've observed no benefit of the, the blood flow restriction stimulus. I would guess that the, the, the goal with power training is really to perform well during the exercise, right? You want to be able to express a lot of force quickly um, to develop that quality over time and blood flow restriction we know diminishes the ability to express force so I'll, at this point I would probably say I'd be cautious of using that in power training I'm, I'm not sure that there's really a, a rationale for doing that um, although in, in my little practical application section on systemic hypoxia particularly at terrestrial altitude I, I'm going to talk briefly about maybe we can use that stimulus to develop muscular power Okay, thank you very much. And then maybe we'll just uh, take two more short questions. One is from Stephen Patterson. 
uh, who's asking uh, uh, what is the heavy, so when discussing load for resistance training in hypoxia, what does like heavy intensity represent? Is it like what above 70% one RM or, or what would you define it? Yeah, so, so I'm assuming this is around the systemic hypoxia uh, work. Um, and we've classified that as about 80% or heavier. So most of the time, it, I don't think it's necessarily the load itself, but the rest period really blows out when you lift those heavier loads. Uh, and as the, the rest period blows out, you have much more time to recover, to resynthesize um, phosphocreatine stores, which are slow, that resynthesis is slow by hypoxia, but not stop. So perhaps over multiple sets, you don't have the same accumulation of stress because of the longer uh, rest period. So generally the, the studies that talk about heavy resistance exercise are, are using loads above 80% in that context. Okay, and then just the final short one before we go to the uh, applied aspect and then we'll answer the other questions later is about the, the, uh, the duration or the how long do the benefits obtained by hypoxic resistance exercise last, you know, because we know we in endurance athletes, we know approximately the, that there's a deacclimation de and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, that there's, uh, to my knowledge, there's no data that's looked at um, the duration of which these benefits last. It, mm -hmm. It's always typically measured immediately following an intervention or within a couple of days um, and not followed up multiple uh, multiple assessments later. So I'm not really sure. I suppose once the stimulus is gone, I would say it would be a similar decay in strength and, and muscle size qualities as if you develop the, the capabilities with normoxic training. Yeah, I would also assume, assume that. So the questions from Gil and Sarah and Kevin are a bit uh, aimed to both of you. So we'll keep them for after your uh, applied uh, uh, session. So now uh, I would just ask Brandon to unshare your screen and then uh, uh, again ask Olivier to share his. Thanks. All right. Cool. Okay. So I just want to warn you, I'm just not sure like if the sound of my video will be off or no. Like, uh, I mean, like I keep playing with that. So just be prepared because <laughs> one is really loud, you know, so just everybody like, you know, be, be ready for that. So all right, so let's finish off, you know, by putting that into perspective. And I have through slide here, like, you know, like, uh, and with Brendan, we have the same like uh, framework here. So I'm going to start about something more specific on repeated sprint training, but uh, Brendan is going to talk about the BFR and the uh, resistance training in hypoxia as well. So I think a common theme is that how we take advantage of this method, right? So if we imagine a reference situation, we have a given training stimulus and a given training quality, or if you prefer on the left-hand side is gonna be the physical stimulation and the right-hand side is gonna be the performance or the power that you can sustain. So compared to the control condition, what is the stress of hypoxia? Well, the stress of hypoxia obviously is gonna increase the training stimulus and one of the challenge will be that we need to preserve the training quality, right? Like if we increase the training stimulus, what we don't want is that we decrease the training quality. If not, we will receive less uh, input from the training. And so maybe not additional benefits of training in hypoxia and maybe you are better at just like training in normoxia, right? Like you lose the advantage of being exposed to, to hypoxia. So this is kind of like summarized by uh, this very famous like trade runners, Kilian Jonet, where he said like, when you use hypoxia, yeah, that's an additional layer uh, that's add variety to the training for sure, but also to be able to increase the, the load of the training session. Right. So on this, uh, there you go. On this video, uh, we have like a unique piece of equipment where we are able to sprint and uh, with the hypoxicator, we are able to repeat those efforts with deprived oxygen condition. And by doing that, what we could figure out is that um, when you repeat a series of sprint with more severe hypoxia, level of La Paz in Bolivia, what we observe is that when we assess the neuromuscular function from before and after this uh, effort, the, the peripheral fatigue or decrease in the twitch uh, that is generated at the muscle level or the muscle contractility, if you prefer, or the muscle disturbance will be higher. And on the other side of the spectrum, like even so the meta metabolic disturbance is gonna be higher, the performance 
is going to be decreased so less training stimulus for the session so that's something that we need to keep in mind how we can best uh, maximize the training stimulus, but at the same time, the preserve the training uh, quality and how we should alter the structure of the session to be able to take advantage of the hypoxic stimulus. And this is something that Frank Broshi put together in his meta-analysis, where he summarized the FIT principle and how we should implement repeated sprint training in hypoxia. As I alluded to uh, the beginning of my talk, maybe a good approach uh, will be to use cluster of sprints in order to uh, minimize the influence of, of the training. Something that's quite striking in the almost 30 studies published today is that nearly all of them have been performed at about 3000 meters, which is considered as moderate altitude. And also uh, nobody really had a hit as an additional layer, right? To potentially get additional uh, stimulation. So, uh, thanks to the French rugby, what, what we are able to do with them uh, is to test new training method and how we can create additional stress uh, with repeated sprint training in hypoxia. So what we did is that we put the chamber at 5,000 meters. So this is something that is quite severe, right? But we were careful that the normoxic between the set of sprints were performing normoxia. So that's why we saw the girl coming in and out of the chamber. They are coming inside the chamber for the set of sprint at 5,000 meters, but going outside the chamber so that they are able to maintain the training quality. Guess what? If they are training at 5,000 meters and also recovering in this environment, obviously the recovery is going to be impaired. And so the training quality is not going to be preserved. So you would be better at doing this kind of training in, in normoxia, simple as that. Uh, because I think they, they believe in this method, they are able also to build their own chamber in Paris uh, where they can play with the hypoxia and the heat as you can see on this, and also as Brendan mentioned, to do some circuit training. So also train some specific skills in, inside the chamber. So you have different means of increasing the training stimulus, right? Being exposed to different severity of hypoxia or adding heat to, to the session, for example. So here are some of my reflection and take home message. Uh, so yeah, the one on top is the most important one is that the context is always king, right? Like any benefits need to be put into context, right? To be fully understood. So before you implement an implement an, an, um, intervention, you always need to ask yourself why you're doing that. What is the limiting factor that you want to try to improve, right? In order to decide what uh, ex attitude exposure or should you add also heat stress to, to the training session? Uh, like I was quite positive in my talk saying like repeated sprint training hypoxia is working, it's quite spectacular, but I mean, you, you saw that we also had negative uh, results and that, yeah, hypoxia like exercise is a stress. So it means that it needs to be managed carefully and there is no guarantee that you're going to get always some better adaptation. Like only if you're able to carefully manage this, then you can expect better adaptation. But if not, you might not get those adaptations. So my message here is that get the training basic first of course you know like the nutrition the recovery the sleep before like you add hypoxia and you expect an additional benefits right what you're going to get with hypoxia is very tiny compared to doing the basic right and that's very important message that i like to to spread today also something I like to discuss maybe with you is individual response uh we saw from the rugby that again like you know like even so on average this is beneficial some don't benefit at all and some benefit largely so what, why is that um, some of this is probably some timing consideration. We are all different. Some might respond positively to a lower dose. Some might need a larger dose. And so what we need to do is continue to yeah, refine the best practice and how we can create uh, the right level of stress and talk about hypoxia. But yeah, you can also use the uh, local hypoxia on this uh, video. Uh, sprinting in 3000 meter and having also the cuff on. So creating a combine like, uh, like Sarah Willis was doing in, in Lausanne for a PhD, systemic and local hypoxia to try to create more adaptation, more benefits. So with this in mind, I'd like to handle the baton to Brandon now to continue uh, uh, some, some experience that he has for you to share. Hey. All right, thank you, Olivier. So um, another important consideration that we, for resistance exercise, but any hypoxic implementation need to have in our minds, I think is the timing of the intervention. Um, I really got thinking about this from the perspective of blood flow restriction. 
a couple of years ago when we ran a study with uh, semi-professional Australian football athletes here in Perth. Um, so this is a demanding uh, contact-based team sport. Um, these folks did, they, they were separated in two groups, blood flow restriction and a, and a non-BFR control, where after their normal weight training sessions, which were two times a week, uh, all participants did low load back squat exercise, but one group did that with BFR, the other without, of course. Uh, and following the training period, so this was in the pre-season, five weeks of training, there was increases in both groups for 3RM back squat strength, the number of reps they could do to fatigue, um, so a marker of muscular endurance, but no difference between the two conditions. And so we got thinking, well, perhaps there's a, a bit of a, an a, a, an effect of an interference effect of the concurrent endurance training that these athletes were doing because they're semi-professional they don't have a huge amount of time to train they were literally finishing their session in the weight room with or without bfr and going straight onto the park to do pre-season conditioning which is of course very demanding um, and considering that most of the mechanisms that we think are at play for blood flow restricted exercise occur via hypertrophy in terms of how it improves strength uh, maybe that blunted the, the benefits of this training due to the timing of it in association with endurance activity. Um, and if you haven't read this paper um, on proposing some different approaches for hypertrophic as well as power development responses with resistance exercise, I think it, it's a great one that really um, opened my eyes to using power training um, perhaps at terrestrial altitude because there's, of course, a, a decreased density of, of air at terrestrial altitude. And we know many athletes now are, are going to altitude training camps for a, a couple of weeks. Traditionally, you wouldn't think that power training would be the most appropriate method to, to train under hypoxic conditions. But if we can lift the bar quicker or throw an implement faster, which has been shown in numerous studies with resistance exercise now, you're constantly being exposed to a, a more demanding power training stimulus. So perhaps in terrestrial altitude training camps, we can prioritize the development of this quality to take advantage of, of what those conditions provide. But uh, as Olivier mentioned as well, we, we need to consider what hypoxia is actually adding. And anytime we're in the weight room, we'll typically change the stimulus for adaptation by altering an acute exercise variable. So the load we lift, for example, we increase the training demands and that of course increases physiological responses as well. Um, but we can perhaps get at that same response without having to change the external load or, or the physical demands of exercise by adding a hypoxic stimulus being BFR or systemic hypoxia to get at this same increase in a physiological stimulus. Um, and then we can think about this from two perspectives, uh, I think. So we can either use it the, the way I've just explained it, um, which is traditionally how it's approached with resistance exercise in systemic hypoxia, trying to do moderate to heavy load resistance exercise and add to the physiological stress to try to drive further adaptations on top of what we might normally gain. Um, but most of the blood flow restriction research takes a, a different approach in that we can decrease the physical dose, we can lift lighter loads, we can do a different type of exercise, perhaps for an equivalent physiological stimulus to drive adaptation um, without having to stress the body uh, from a mechanical perspective as much at least. But now obviously we're adding <clears throat> a new acute exercise variable. We need to um, have an understanding of how to manipulate that properly. So the dose is likely important. The pressure of blood flow restriction. Some pilot work we've got going on at the moment um, around cycling exercise. Show we're doing some repeat sprints with cycling. Uh, uh, re repeat cycling sprints with blood flow restriction, sorry. And pressures above 45% arterial occlusion pressure, participants just can't get through the, the repeated sprint task. So that the pressure needs to come down as the intensity goes up. Of course, we all know that the, the dose is important for um, systemic hypoxia as well. So other things to consider there. And so to, to leave you with a, a few take home points as Olivier just did as well, um, I, I really think that it's important to take advantage of what the hypoxic stimulus provides. It's not always going to be beneficial and it might only be beneficial in certain circumstances if we design exercise appropriately to really use what the hypoxia adds. So if we're using blood flow restriction, we know typically low load exercise is going to provide a potent stimulus for muscle size and strength. We might be able to use some sports specific activities to um, improve what I've termed very vaguely here, fatigue resistance. Um, and there's more work needs to be done there, but that could potentially have some benefits moving forward. And if we're looking to approach this from a systemic point of view, well, the circuits that Domingo Ramos Campo is working on, uh, that provides a potent metabolic challenge to drive that stimulus. And 
aside from the muscular development <clears throat> uh, changes, well, they, they've seen improvements in repeated sprint ability and, and in VO2 max there. So that, that's a, a beneficial stimulus for some adaptations. Um, and the ballistic training potentially at altitude camps to take advantage of the, the changes in, in air pressure. So that's my last slide. Thank you all for your attention. Um, and perhaps now we can uh, address some practical questions together, Olivier. Sure. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Brandon and Olivier, obviously, for, uh, I think it's really important that we put the findings of these studies into perspective and that we really realize that, you know, hypoxia is one aspect and, you know, there's many aspects of uh, training induced adaptations and, and benefits. And I think it's really, really nice that we combine the basic data with some uh, applied, applied uh, take home messages, let's say. Um, so we have quite a few uh, questions. I think the first one is more aimed at Olivier or hypoxia in general, and it's from Gil on a debatable topic. Essentially, if there's, if you consider that there's a difference in results to training or performance when the training is performed in the hypoxic chamber, which I probably consider uh, normobaric hypoxia versus altitude, so versus the real uh, hypobaric hypoxic exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a debate for sure that is still <laughs> ongoing. I mean, like, uh, um, yeah, depending on which side of the glass, you know, look at like some will say like, uh, you know, that's a tiny difference. And then, yes, I mean, like, I believe that the terrestrial altitude is slightly st uh, stronger stimulus, but, you know, like if you increase the if you match the PIO to, you know, by increasing the simulated hypoxia, you know, then you can get to the same stress. And then, uh, yeah, after like the question is, is it clinically relevant, the difference? Yeah, like if you're able to match that, I I'm not sure. After there are some like a consideration, the air resistance is one, of course. And then Brendan showed that from the Spanish study, when you lift power, of course, because there is less air resistance, so you can lift that. Uh, faster and then that has some implication on, on the power and the same will occur also when you have to sprint right if there is less resistance then maybe like if we want to beat uh, Usain Bolt record then maybe we should again organize some games you know like at altitude and maybe we can <laughs> take advantage uh, to to again like set new records but yeah to my knowledge that's not really clinically significant but that's my humble opinion. Yeah we, I believe that in, if we look from a uh, an athletic or practical perspective. And we, if we take the considerations in terms of logistics and everything into account, and given that the, for a general general uh, response, it seems to be similar, I would also believe that from a practical perspective, it's a reasonable way to use um, normal barrack or altitude chamber or whatever. Sure, well, um, you, you can stay in your environment. You don't have the stress of traveling. Like, here, yeah, this has a cost, uh, of course. So you need to wait all, all this, you know, obviously. Uh, you know, like you can benefit from the same medical treatment and yeah, training environment. So, yeah, what you will get from one side, I think, yeah, it's going to be largely compensated. So, Yeah, thanks a lot. So we have another um, question from my friend, Sarah Willis. And she's, I think, more relating to Brandon in terms of what's your perspective on using uh, BFR during continuous exercise. You know, you mm -hmm. mentioned something in your talk, but uh, what would your opinion be on that? Yeah, so there, there's an increasing body of literature around that at the moment. Um, the first consideration is, of course, when we talk about continuous exercise with blood flow restriction, we, we just can't do it for the same duration as unrestricted because it would be unsafe to restrict blood flow for an extended period of time. The longest I've seen it in a study is 20 minutes. Um, and we're actually doing some work at the moment to look at the, the different responses when we increase the duration of intervals with blood flow restriction. That's um, one of our PhD students is just starting that work at the moment. Um, so with the low speed or low power output cardiovascular type of modalities, often they're five minute or 10 minute bouts. Um, there's a number of studies that have shown improvements in cardiovascular measures, uh, so VO2 max and, and also uh, anaerobic capacity. In, in one study that was done with Korean basketball players, they actually improved their anaerobic capacity by 2.5%. They were already decently trained athletes um, walking on a treadmill uh, with blood flow restriction cuffs on for, um, I can't remember the exact duration off the top of my head, but it was minutes. It wasn't a, 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 an extended duration. Um, there's some work around older people uh, who 
uh, perhaps at a, a more deconditioned state and have further to further to go in terms of gains from that type of training and improvements in functional measures of timed up and go and, and sit to stand type of tasks as well as a range of sort of fitness variables. Um, but it seems to be a, a bit of a powerful tool to cross a number of types of adaptations doing aerobic exercise with blood flow restriction. We get muscular benefits as well as cardiovascular adaptation. So almost a, a low intensity, one size fits all approach um, to, to get some adaptations across a, a broad spectrum. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, this one, uh, so we have a question which is more general and related to the last one. And it's from Katja Bratima, I guess from Slovenia based on the name. So um, uh, she's, uh, uh, she's wondering if a specific team sports physical performance uh, uh, for, for that maybe systemic hypoxic approach is better. And if you want to induce some peripheral effects or peripheral factors, then potentially repeated sprintability or blood flow restriction is in, in general, would you agree on that or? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, 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 the stress combination of methods. Yeah, surely. <laughs> After yeah, it's like agree. logistical problem. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. We know that uh, the effects of systemic and local are, are not always the same. Yeah. So, uh, and then we have a question from, sorry. If, if you've tried blood flow restriction exercise as well, particularly trying higher intensity modalities of cardiovascular, like repeat sprint, I was piloting for one of my PhD students uh, earlier in the week, we did repeat sprints with blood flow restriction cuffs in place. It's a real challenge peripherally. You feel like you're cycling through mud. It's a, a big challenge. So if that's the adapt or adaptations that stem from that type of training or what you're chasing, then it could be beneficial. Um, but you also have to bear in mind that there's going to probably be a large decrement in what you can achieve in a training session. Okay. And this one also, I think uh, Kevin's question also relates to systemic hypoxia and uh, resistance training or, you know, repeated sprint training. And uh, he's wondering what the, what was the, le the optimal level of hypoxia that would achieve max, you know, to maximize the benefits or performance benefits or hypertrophy or do you have any idea in terms of, let's say, resistance exercise or maybe repeated sprint training? You mentioned that, but maybe just a comment. So I think you're yeah. talking about the minimal dose and that that's the important question. As mentioned, like Brandon mentioned, like uh, in the series of uh, study that we conducted and then Sarah Willis was also doing something like this in Switzerland where she tried different uh, curve pressure, you know, like and different severity of hypoxia. Uh, the higher is not necessarily the better because, you know, like maybe you get the same like uh, an enough like stimulation with lower load and combination with uh, hypoxia. But then after what you're going to increase is just the pain and then the discomfort and then you're less willing, you know, to continue exercise. So, yeah, obviously, uh, yeah, uh, I, I would not go with the higher is, is the better for sure. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Nishimura paper that I, I presented, the graph that showed the improvements in elbow flexor size and strength, that was 16% fraction of inspired oxygen. Um, some studies have used more severe levels, but they showed pretty potent responses with what I guess a relatively moderate level for that acute exposure. Yeah, at the end of the day, we just need to create a potent metabolic uh, stress, right? And then for that, uh, there are consideration about uh, rest, about the volume, like the number of effort that you're going to perform and the hypoxia severity, uh, the systemic and the local one. Um, if you don't take these three parameters uh, into consideration, then you will not create additional stress with hypoxia. So in terms of rest it has to be quite short, right? Uh, you need to have like a, a certain volume, right? Like if it's a really high load on short volume, then you're not going to take advantage of the stress of, of hypoxia, right? Yeah. It's definitely uh, different parameters, especially when you combine it with uh, exercises, you know, and hypoxic exposure. And there's uh, obviously a sweet spot for some, for everything, for all of the parameters, but you never know. So I was really, so, you know, the 5,000 meters, the female rugby players, I mean, that was, uh, you know, that was uh, strong, yeah. Uh, well, the, the problem is like there is a lot of interimendible variability. Uh, I mean, like we know that, but the variability is even uh, larger, like when you increase the hypoxic stimulus, right? Like, so the spread of the response is even larger. And this is what we observe with, with the girl, right? Like some, they were in the low 80 and so they were like below 70, you know, like, so that's pretty, that's pretty tough, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. We should so we should say that there's an individual sweet spot, obviously, yeah, <laughs> for the training adaptations. So next one uh, is a question for Brandon, I believe, from Ralph Gordon. And if there's any evidence to show that, uh, for example, hypoxic training also uh, modulates a rate of force development. Hmm. Um, th there's a little bit of evidence of that in blood flow, some blood flow restriction studies, um, probably just coming on account of the improvement in strength as opposed to some of the neural changes that occur to enhance rate of force development. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything around that from let me think, the systemic hypoxia, I'd have to have a look at some of those Spanish studies again, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but potentially with that terrestrial approach that they've taken in a, a few of their papers, there could be an improvement in power output and, and rate, rate of force development with that modality, obviously different normobaric versus hyperbaric, but potentially there, yeah. Okay, and then the next question is for Olivier. Uh, and it's about uh, your thoughts on using uh, ischemic preconditioning as a hypoxic stimulus before the, the competition or before the performance um, as yeah. a... So as I mentioned, like in the panorama, that's the, the first method, right? Like, so ischemic preconditioning, like to be clear, it's this process where you're gonna occlude the limb for five minutes and then you're gonna do that bilaterally. So it means that you're gonna release the cuff on one side by the time you occlude the other side and you do that three to four times. So we're talking about half an hour to 40 minute practice. And then 40 minutes after, you're gonna see if that's increased performance, right? Well. The literature is very controversial on that topic. That's the least I can say in terms of repeated sprint training. I mean, there is a good study by Stephen Peterson uh, in MSSC that clearly showed that the performance was improved in the first few repetitions. And this is probably something to do with the blood flow. But to be honest, like in Switzerland and in, in Australia, I've been conducting studies on that practice and then I never ever saw any benefits. <laughs> Uh, so what we've been doing uh, recently is try to combine uh, the, 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 the occlusion with light exercise in order to create more uh, metabolic disturbance. And by doing that, actually, we saw that this is actually working for repeated sprinting. When you just like cycling at really low intensity, I'm talking about 30 watts, right? And then you occlude the limb, not for five minutes, but for one minute on, one minute off. And if you do that, compared to uh, if you do that uh, at rest, like the common practice, that again, we confirmed didn't work. Uh, that's a small sample site that was on a project. So we don't have, we have, I think, five or six participants. But it's quite clear that light exercise with the BFR seems to be the way forward to get some more robust benefits, hopefully, but needs to be confirmed. But yeah, again, like involvement of the methods. <laughs> OK, thanks a lot. Another question for you, Olivier, and it relates to uh, offsetting the perception of fatigue by using uh, repeated sprint training. Do you think that uh, using this method, you can offset the, the fatigue perception? And if yes, in what type of scenarios does this occur in, in athletes? Well, I don't have some straight answer with some data. Uh, obviously, when you're exposed to hypoxia, yeah, like, I mean, like, repeated sprint tra training is uh, all out effort, right? So you should give like mental effort that is maximum every time. So I like to think that no matter if you do that in hypoxia or normoxia, by doing this sort of training, right? That's like improve your willingness to like uh, uh, postpone the fatigue and, you know, like tolerate, you know, like a higher level of fatigue. So I would like to imagine that that's uh, beneficial for that. Uh, after like if hypoxia adds something about the perception, like when you after like uh, compete near sea level, uh, I don't know. Okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know. And you know, like when we run study, we always ask about the blinding and usually the participant because the effort is all out. So they are not able to guess, you know, in which condition they are, right? Compared to when you do that at the maximal intensity where it comes quite obvious, you know? So I think that, yeah, the exercise routine per se effect is much stronger than like the added effect of hypoxia. So I would like to say that, yeah, maybe that kind of training could be pretty useful, but after like, is hypoxia is gonna make you tougher? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think next question is for both of you and uh, it's from uh, Pietro from uh, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And he's, uh, uh, he's interested in this hypoventilation technique that was investigated by Varons and colleagues and a few of the papers mentioned there. 
do you think that's a useful technique when you, or maybe even more potent when you use them, use it in uh, conditions of environmental hypoxia? Well, I think it can be useful if we are able to create some hypoxic condition. And when you are able to track the SPO2, for example, we know that you, we have a sweet spot, right? Like you need to drop the, yeah, the SPO2, like, and then hopefully be around 85%. And yeah, a few studies from the French and the latest one from my colleague, uh, Charlie, uh, for Nassia Santos show with rugby player that by holding their breath, basically, yes, they're able to stay in the high 80s. So I like to think that could be potentially working. And what they saw is like similar to this phase study that they're able after this kind of training uh, four weeks, twice a week in developing player to be able to perform more sprint before they reach exhaustion. So I think that might work as long as that you create like a true hypoxic stimulus, right? Yeah, and that, that yeah, uh, yeah, Brandon, go ahead if you have any. Uh, I, I, I could say that, that could be a challenge in resistance exercise, particularly if you're looking um, to do some perhaps technically demanding activities like squats and deadlifts and even bench press and, and things which require often a big breath to be taken in and an increase in intra-abdominal pressure to be able to perform the exercise really well. And, and athletes who use these exercises often will use those breathing techniques to sort of set a rigid um, midsection and perform the exercise with a lot of power. So I think um, if you're going to look down that path, you'd have to select exercises that aren't really as demanding on uh, techniques like leg extensions and, and things of that nature, perhaps. But I'm not aware of anyone that's investigated that in resistance exercise so far. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions before we sum it up. And the first one is more of a methodological one. It, it's from Ismail. And uh, he's wondering if there might be a difference uh, to training adaptations in hypoxia when you use the masks connected to the hypoxic generator or when you perform it in a normal barrack uh, hypoxic facility or attempt? Mm. Um, from a resistance exercise point of view, I think the only difference would be that it changes the type of exercises you can do um, because it's, it's cumbersome to have the mask on and uncomfortable. And particularly if you're doing circuit type of work, that becomes a real challenge. Um, so I, I don't know if there'd be a, a physiological difference between the two methods, but from a practical point of view, I can see being in a chamber would be a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, I mean, nothing much to add. I would imagine that it's the same stress, right? The inspired fraction of oxygen is the same. It's just the discomfort that might limit some of the movement. And if that's the case, then maybe the willingness of the athletes, you know, to keep pushing and that might be the limitation there, more than the physical limitation. Oh, I, actually, something that I, I did, um, just thinking about that question a bit more, during my PhD, we the high load back squat and deadlift exercise participants were, were breathing through the mask and particularly with the higher load type of work we did um, I mentioned before that they want to take a big breath in and set that intra-abdominal pressure because they're trying to suck in a whole bunch of air through the tube they couldn't get enough air in quickly enough to set their midsection they felt unstable quote unquote during the exercise um, and we talked about oh this would have been great if we had a chamber so perhaps that could could be a benefit to the chamber for that high load resistance exercise. Well, that's true. Now that I'm thinking is the same, you know, like you will be limited by the hypoxicator, you know, like at high ventilation rate, you know, like maybe like the, the hypoxicator will not be able to cope, you know, and then like you, the dose that you're going to receive is going to be lower. But assuming that that's not the case and then on the market, they are pretty good products. Uh, I would imagine that that's similar, but yeah, maybe for the cheapest one, like, yeah. Uh, that might be okay for lower intensity, but yeah, at higher uh, work rate, like higher ventilation rate, that might become a problem. Yeah, thanks. I agree that uh, physiologically speaking, it should be the same, but you know, uh, application is different. So then uh, we have a question for Olivier about what are your thoughts about uh, how should we in individualize the repeated sprints training in hypoxia protocols in regards to endurance athletes, which are focused maybe on uh, sprint distances versus long distances uh, in competitions. Is there a, you know, a way to individualize that approach in terms of their, their um, category or distance that they're competing? Well, what you probably need to do is to uh, alter the, the training routine, you know, like the duration of the sprinting, the recovery and play with that, you know, like to uh, put more emphasis on the uh, glycolytic, you know, or the oxidative pathway. Uh, that's what I like to do, you know, uh, 
also playing with the hypoxia and then that's just the combo of uh, all this you know that uh, will alter the, the the physical stimulus and how you can preserve the the adaptation um surely yeah thanks and now with, with the final question from brian uh, so uh, he's uh, referring to the sweet spot that that we've mentioned and what would the finger pulse oximetry reading so spo2 uh, would be typical that you like would you would like to achieve in a chamber you know it's obviously different on a setting but uh, have you seen any anecdotal patterns to suggest spo2 values that can predict those who are better responders so for example if if you know the spo2 would be higher or, or lower or would that be a benefit or well, like we are doing some work now to try to understand by different combination of hypoxia severity and uh, jogging slash running speed, you know, like, uh, like what, like it's the uh, modulation in terms of the decrease in the performance and is it concomitant with the physical stress and it seems like it, it's not. So that's why we need to get those results to understand, you know, like what would be the good combination. For example, like maybe running at 10 k an hour in normoxia will be the same. Like, sorry, running at 14 k an hour in normoxia might be the same that running slower at 10 k at 3,000 meter in terms of the SpO2, right? Or even more so, even more severe hypoxia, uh, and walking even slower. But at the end of the day, after if you don't get you know like a sufficient uh, training stimulus, you know, like in terms of the the mechanics, then you 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 miss the point, you know. So yes, there is a sweet spot after what it is, we don't really know. That's certainly individual. So like when we say a three or 4,000 meter doesn't mean much, like maybe we should target SpO2 value, right? And then adjust the, the machine, you know, to be able to give you this uh, SpO2 rather than the opposite, right? So yeah, that's how we can minimize the entire individual response. And for that, uh, maybe we need to move from uh, looking only at the output, like the simulated altitude, but more like uh, looking at, uh, you know, like the, what's the internal stress in terms of the SpO2, right? And calculate some ratio, like the SpO2 over the FiO2 ratio, uh, as we recently proposed, that's probably like one starting point. Okay, Olivier, you have, uh, sorry, Brandon, you have any final uh, comments? Um, so we, we've noted, um, SpO2 values around about high 80s or 90s for that 16% FiO2 that, that tended to show benefits in in, um, in some published work. But of course, a huge variation. I had some participants in that study get into the, the 70s. Um, and I, I'd like to, to Olivia's point, I think maybe there might be some something to individualizing the dose based on the individual's response to the hypoxic stimulus, the, the SpO2, to try to clamp it at, at a set level. Um, but I, I don't know if there's any research that shows that's a better approach in resistance exercise at the moment, at least, because there's just so much variation in the responses. It's hard to pull out what change in, in SpO2 is really going to result in the better response in the muscle. Yeah, it's highly individual, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks again. I would really like to thank again both of the speakers uh, for today's session. Uh, so Olivier and Brandon, really thanks a lot for your uh, contributions. Uh, and with this, we will sum up the, se the today's session. I would just like to remind you that uh, you can uh, keep up to date with all of our um, uh, subsequent uh, talks and the webinars by following the ICEE 2021.com or you can obviously follow us on Twitter. You can also interact with, um, with us over our email ICEE2021 at gmail.com. And uh, I wish you a pleasant day or, or a good morning or good afternoon, however, and hope to see you all uh, in 14 days. <laughs>